Hi guys, welcome to my channel and two years ago Google released a paper called An Image is Worth 16 by 16 Words and it was the first successful application of transformers to computer vision tasks. So in this video I would like to cover this paper and explain why it actually matters, how it works, how it was trained and the results they achieved at the end. So let's jump into it. First of all we know that the transformer architecture become de facto standard for NLP tasks but its application to computer vision remained limited. It's also worth to mention why actually Transformer took over the NLP field. So first of all, they are easy to scale. Like we can just basically increase the number of the layers or heads or dimensions inside, right? They utilize the GPU properly, unlike the sequential models like uh, recurrent neural network. They also have a um, attention mechanism that gives the global understanding of the input data, which was also problematic in sequential models when it was losing some information and we added the attention mechanism, but it didn't work quite well. So yeah, that's why the Transformer took over the NLP field. I also want to mention, if you haven't watched my video about the Transformers yet, uh, go check it out first because this paper is heavily relied on the Transformer architecture and I'm not going to cover it in details here, but if you want to know more about it, just go and check it out. So let me show you what are the pros and cons of Transformers and CNN. So to start with, the Transformers are domain agnostic architecture, which means that they are not created for a particular task because they can be fed with any 1D sequence data. They technically can approximate much broader range, a range of functions than the CNNs or RNNs. So RNNs were created with this inductive bias to analyze sequential data. CNNs were created to analyze the images. Transformers is universal enough that it can learn both and even much more. The downside of Transformers is that it requires a lot of data to learn those inductive biases. In order to analyze the sequential data, it, it it needs to be fed with much more of the data to actually learn what is sequential data rather than the RNNs architecture has this bias of analyzing the sequential data. Another thing is that they are sensitive to the sequence length. So that's one of the biggest problems of Transformer. They are quadratic in cost when it comes to calculating the attention score. So to give you an example, the GPT-3 had a context window of 1024 words, which already was problematic because it was losing some of the sense when it was generating a text. So we're gonna get to it later why it's a huge drawback of Transformer. Okay, so the CNNs has this translation invariance and locally restricted receptive field. So what it means is basically CNN has this kernel that moves around the image, the sliding window, and it just extracts the features from the image. And as we know, because it can move all around the image, it's always extract the pattern that it's looking for. So no matter if the cat is on the top left corner or top right, it's always extract the features from the image. That's the advantage when it comes to the drawbacks. It, it's lacking a global understanding of the image. So as we know, it has this sliding window, but it doesn't have the overall view of the image. So that's also a problem. And it's the main specific solution. So it can only be, it's created to analyze images. Coming back to the paper, um, we see that transformers are lacking some of the inductive biases inherent to CNNs, such as translation equivariance and locality, and therefore do not generalize well when trained on inefficient amount of data. So we know the transformer needs to learn all of this stuff from scratch. So as you can see, the naive application of self-attention to images would require to each pixel attends to every other pixel but with quadratic cost in number of pixel this does not scale realistic input sizes so that was the problem in image gpt they basically fed the gpt architectures with the pixel from the image but what they had to do it's pretty much minimize the images to 32 on 32 and in the largest model it was 64 on 64 which is still a really small image that's still the problem of the a quadratic cost of the attention mechanism. So if you want to know more, by the way, about the image GPT, I covered it in my last video and all of the GPT paper. So go there if you want to check it out. They also tried the sparse transformers uh, and they employ scalable approximation to global self-attention in order to be applicable to images. Still, many of the specialized attention architectures demonstrate promising results on computer vision tasks but require complex engineering to be implemented efficiently on hardware accelerators. So it wasn't really easy task to actually somehow convert images to 
then be passed to transformer and they will be efficient in terms of uh, calculating the attention score. So now we can actually move and see how Google did it in an efficient way. Okay, so first let's take an image. Let's say it's 30 on 30 and we build into the patches. So we have nine patches. Each patch is 10 on 10. And obviously it has three channels. Then we flatten it and then we take each of the patch and again flatten it and make the 1D vector out of it, right? And then we create the embeddings out of it. So we basically pass it to like a linear network and it project it to the embedding space. Now we have our embedding patches and we add the position embedding. So it's basically the information about the position of the patch in the image, but these positions are learned from the scratch. For me, what is mind blowing about this that basically we model doesn't have any idea about the image itself and also the, even the position is learned. It only got this 1D vectors and based on the embeddings of those networks, it can achieve really good results. It's just mind blowing for me. But anyway, we just pass these embeddings to transformer encoder, which is basically almost the same as the, the same as GPT network. We got our classification head and that's it. So that's really simple architecture. They also add this extra learnable class embedding, which is unnecessary. I guess it makes sense when you have the network that do different different stuff, few different stuff, like for example, classification, segmentation and something else. So the model can distinguish the task that it's handling right now, but in this case it's totally unnecessary. But anyway, just to show you, it's pretty much the same architecture as in attention is all you need paper. So this is also really crazy that this architecture is so universal. Now we have the model. Now I'm going to show you how it was trained. So in many cases, and especially when we train transformers, there's a pre-training phase and the fine tuning. Pretty much the same as it was in GPT-1. Uh, we feed it with the huge data set. GFT-300 is 300 million images with, I think, 18,000 classes. They also try a different model with ImageNet 21K. And later on, they just fine tune it on, on five different data sets. And that's pretty much it. That's the whole idea behind it. They introduce three different models. They have a VAT base, large and huge. Obviously the difference is in the layers, hidden size, MLP size and head. So they did it to actually show how the opacity of the model and the size of the data sets influence the results. Also few technical stuff. So first of all, as I mentioned, the positional embeddings at initialization time carry no information about the 2D positions of the patches and all spatial relations between the patches have to be learned from scratch. So this is really like mind blowing that the model itself learned to have this global understanding of the image and even like the construct of the image itself. I want to mention the, the models, the pre they pre-trained the models using the Adam optimizer with the batch size of 4096 images and they apply a height weight decay of 0 0.1, which normally is 0 0.0001. Also, when it comes to fine tuning, they actually use the HDD with momentum. When it comes to results, they compare it with the ResNet with weight standardization and group normalization, which is called BIT. So weight standardization and group normalization is, is a replacement for batch normalization to actually train the bigger models. I already cover it in one of my Medium blog posts, which I link down below, and you can go check it out and find out more about it. They also use a hybrid. The hybrid is basically the ResNet that extracts the features, and we pass to those extracted features as it patches to the transformer. They just use also the efficient net architecture. So as you can see here, um, the biggest model, VIT Huge, beat the state of the art results on pretty much all data sets. Only at one data set, the VIT L got better results. Also, this number next to the model size uh, denotes the, the size of the patch. So in this case, it's 14 on 14, and in this case, it's 16 on 16. So few insights from these results. Um, first of all, it took much less to train the even the largest VIT model than the ResNet or EfficientNet. As we can see, the visual transformer requires much less compute. Uh, second of all, the results of the transformer uh, are getting better with the larger models and the larger data, larger data sets. So they train it on image 21K and they got worse results than they trained it on GFT. So that's a two insights. They also share more of it in the paper itself. So as I stated before, they wanted to show here how the data sets and the size of the model influence the results produced by the transformer. So the vision transformer performs well when pre-trained on large GFT 
300 mil dataset with fewer inductive biases for vision than ResNets. How crucial is the dataset size? So they perform two series of experiments. They have this figure over there where y axis is the image net performance and where the y axis is image accuracy, image net accuracy, and the x axis is pre-training dataset. So they have three datasets, image net, image net 21k and GFT. And as you can see for smaller datasets, the ResNet outperforms the transformer. So the ResNet is basically this gray area. It significantly outperforms, right? When it comes to larger data sets, it's still, it's almost the same, but when it comes to GFT, the transformer performs much better. So it shows that these bigger models with bigger data sets, transformer models, performs better because they can learn those inductive biases. And that's what basically the history of deep learning shows us, that the stuff that we feature engineer essentially going to perform worse than the things that they can be learned by the model itself. So as you remember previously before CNNs we got the pre-fine kernels to analyze images and they perform well. When the CNN came uh, with much more data and much more compute we achieved much better results. And in this case when you have a model that, in, that can actually learn something that we predefined before, like the inductive bias of the architecture, obviously it's going to perform much better when we give it more data and compute. <laughs> so that's the idea behind it, and that's the proof of it. Okay, so they mentioned, while large VIT models perform worse than ResNets, uh, when pre-trained on small data sets, they sh shine when pre-trained on large data sets. Similarly, larger v VIT models overtake smaller ones at as the data set grows. So this is the sc scalability of the transformers. More data and bigger models uh, should produce much better results. Okay, that, so the other graph they show is basically the transfer accuracy on y-axis and the x-axis is a total pre-training compute. They compare it on average five data sets and as you can see here, the green squares are the ResNet and almost for the same compute, the VIT performs much better. So this is the, uh, so, that shows that basically they are more efficient. Uh, we get better results for the same amount of compute. As you can see, also the hybrid models performs better here. It's mostly because they don't need to learn all of these inductive biases from scratch. But this changes when it comes to the bigger models and with larger compute. They state here, vision transformers generally outperform ResNets with the same computa computational budget. Hybrids improve upon pure transformers for smaller model size but the gap vanishes for larger models. So that also comes back to what I mentioned before, the inductive bias learned are much better than the ones that are feature engineered by human. Okay, so at the end, they basically sum up the insights from the paper and the graphs. First, vision transformers dominate ResNets on a performance compute trade-off. That's what we saw in the last graph. VIT uses approximately two to four times less compute to, to attain the same performance. Second, Hybrids slightly outperform VIT at small computational budgets, but the difference vanishes for larger models. That's what, also what I m mentioned before about the inductive biases. And third, vision transformer appear not to saturate within the range tried, motivating future scaling efforts. So it still hasn't it still hasn't saturated. We still can increase the dataset size and the and the models itself, and we will see what's going to come out of it. So that's really interesting. Um, there's a few challenges, of obviously the uh, the input size and how we're going to mo make it more efficient, the attention mechanism, but still it looks promising. And I think it's the direction that we, the whole AI community will go when it comes to computer vision. So I also add some of mine conclusions. The transformer architecture is able to mimic CNN cap capabilities. Um, it just basically can learn those inductive biases and that's a proof of it. Another thing is the simple strategy of training transformer with, with a lot of data works well. So that's also crazy that basically we take the same architecture that was used for GPT and NLP tasks and put a lot of data into it, train it, and it just performs, it just beat the state-of-the-art results, which is really crazy. And the third is VIT outperforms the state-of-the-art results on image classification tasks. So that's what I mentioned before, but also it doesn't saturate. We don't know where the limits are. So that's really interesting and I'm really keen on reading more papers about uh, vision transformers and share them with you. So that's it for this video. I want to mention that in the next video I will cover the code implementation of Vision Transformer in PyTorch. I also add some information how to convert weights from released by Google from JAX to PyTorch and some other cool insights. So stay tuned for that and 
again if you enjoyed that kind of videos just hit the like and subscribe button and yeah see you in the next video